Well, hello everybody and thank you so much for watching our online service from wherever you're at. Whether you're alone or you're watching with some family and friends, I just want to personally say thank you for jumping on today. I'm telling you 2020 is weird, right? I mean, it's just, just the craziest time that we've ever had, I think in my lifetime, so much uncertainty so many questions uh, we've had people ask us so many questions and honestly it feels like it's a roller coaster it's like you know corona's finally going away and then well no it's back again and let me just tell you one thing that is certain that's jesus christ he is the same yesterday today and forever and because we believe that we can put our faith that we can trust in him even in these uncertain times so what i'm going to ask you to do uh, as our church is really to do three things during this season. We're still in this season, and we can't discount doing these things because together we can make a major, major difference for not only the kingdom of God, but in our community, okay? So the first thing that we could do is pray. Never discount prayer. Never discount what God can do through you, through your prayers. In fact, it says that if you ask anything according to His will, He hears you. And if you know He hears you, we know that we have that which we have asked of Him. How great is that? So God wants to answer prayer. He just needs us, his children, to pray out the will of God uh, here on earth. Amen, everybody? So we need to pray. So never discount that. And uh, we are part still partnering with Unite714.com to pray during this season. And uh, as this season seems like it's almost never going to end, I promise you it's going to end. Like, it's going to end. But I, I, until this season ends, I'm telling you, we need to press in. We need to press in and pray like we've never prayed before. We can't just have a wait and see. Well, I'm just going to wait till it passes. No, we're not going to wait and see. We're going to actually attack this in the spiritual we don't war against flesh and blood, but we war in the spiritual. And how we do that is on our knees. How we do that is our prayers to God. So we need to be the church during this season. This is something that you can do to be part of uh, what we're doing. And when we're intentional about this, uh, it means that, that it happens all the time. And that, I'm telling you, um, it's, just, it's just a really good thing uh, to be a part of, okay? So the second thing that you can do during this season is give. And I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. It's so important to keep the church strong right now during this season so we can continue to do our outreaches to give hope and healing away to people. In fact, you may see uh, the Facebook donate button if you're watching this uh, on Facebook. And any funds that are given to that are immediately going to go out uh, into our community and buy things like diapers and formula and bottled water uh, to pass out to the homeless. And we plan on doing some of these outreaches so that we can just love our city. And let me just tell you, this is when Christianity matters. That when we are the church, whenever we actually put our, our resources behind us and actually love people, that's when it really matters. That's when we make the biggest difference. So our tithes and our offerings, our generosity is huge during this season. And again, I just want to thank you so much uh, for being willing to give and sow into the lives of other people uh, to really see God's kingdom advance and to see people be loved in our city. So thank you so much for that. All the giving options are there on the screen. It's super easy. You can give by text. You can give online, uh, you can give by the Facebook uh, donate button as well. All those things um, are there and you can avail yourself to that. And we never pressure anybody to give, right? All we do is ask you to pray and ask God what you should do. But let me tell you something, when we all do something, something happens exponentially. It actually makes a lot and we can do more for the kingdom of God. So just thank you, thank you so much for doing that. Third thing that you can do is reach, is reach. So it's pray, it's give, and it's reach. Well, how, how am I supposed to reach? Well, we reach by sharing and we reach by serving, okay? So the easiest way to reach is just to press share on the button, okay? Just to press the share button uh, on Facebook and let other people know about this message. If it speaks to you, if it brings life to you, if it brings hope and healing to your life, then press share on it and, and, and just let somebody else know, whether it's a YouTube link or a Facebook share, just let somebody else know about it. Why? Because I'm telling you, when you share the link, you actually share God's love. And it's so, so, so vitally important during this 
this season that we give hope and healing away to other people. And since we can't physically bring somebody to the church and invite somebody physically to the church, we got to go to them. And right now, it's as easy as pressing a button or texting a link. It's so easy when we share. The second thing that we can do uh, is serve. Now, we're getting ready to have some more serving opportunities. And I know with, you know, the coronavirus and, and stuff has gone on right now and, and, and you know, there's more masks and there might be some, some more things, uh, protocols that we need to follow. But we cannot stop being the church during this season. We still need to love the least of these. We still need to be a light. So we're going to continue and ramp up our serving efforts uh, during this um, during this season. And so there's going to be opportunities for you to be able to pass out food. There's going to be opportunities for you to pass out water to the homeless. There's going to be opportunities for you to do some of these things so that we could just love our city uh, during this season. So we could pray, we could give, and we could reach. We can do those three things. So today's message is a throwback message of a series that we did last year called Frequency. And the whole idea of Frequency is tuning into God's voice and tuning out the world. You know, our lives can be cluttered. It can be filled with so many negative thoughts and emotions. And it's important to have clarity. And so I hope this message uh, brings hope and healing to your life. So grab your notes, grab your Bibles, and get ready to hear a word from God today that can change your life. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing in our life. We ask you, God, to move today. We ask you, God, to move in our life today. We ask you, God, to help us see what you want us to see. Help us, Father God, hear what you want us to hear right on our hearts today, God. Help us to become who you want us to become and that it would change the course of our life. But God, that it wouldn't stop there. Because everything that you've given to us, you designed to move through us to the people that you died for and the people that you love. So I ask you, God, these things that we hear today, that we would practice them doing them, and we would do them to change a generation with your love and your grace, to bring hope and healing to this world. In Jesus' name, and those who agree with that said, amen. amen. So this, this new series called Frequency is called Cutting Through the Noise. And I'm just going to tell you right off the bat that we have a speaking God. Like, we have a speaking God. He hasn't stopped speaking today. Like, he wants to speak to you. And I think the number one question that we get in Christianity is this. The number one question that I get is, is you know, how do I know if God is speaking to me? I think if anybody who's followed Christ for any length of time, you have heard this. I know God wants to speak to me. I know he, he can and he will, but how do I know if it really happens? How, how do I really know what that really looks like? I think at one time or another, all of us have had this question. What, what does that look like? How do I know if God is speaking to me? And I'm telling you, he speaks today like God speaks today. He's not silent. In fact, God is eternal. He's eternal. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help me out with that. Yesterday, today, and forever, he is the same. And so if God is the constant, then we know that when he spoke the world into existence, in fact, it says in Genesis that he said, God, what? He said, let there be light, and there was light. And I'm under the impression, since God is the same, that this world is still held together by the echo of God's voice that was first spoken. I really believe that, that it's not something that has happened, it's something that is happening, that God is life, that he is the epitome of life itself, and that this whole world is just a perpetual state of, of, that is held together by God. Like, I just, I truly believe that. And if you look at the Revelation, the end of the Bible, it, Jesus says things to the, to the churches, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Let him hear, let him hear. So God has, he doesn't have a speaking problem. I would actually dare say that we got a hearing problem. It's not that he has a speaking issue because so many times we label our life as, well, God is not speaking to me. And I would actually disagree and I would say, no, he's speaking. I just don't think that we can hear him. I don't think we can hear him. And the reason why I don't think we can hear him is, is multiple. And I want to show you this today. Uh, I want to help you understand this. Is this all right? Let's, uh, let's go to John chapter 10, our theme verse for today. And the, what Jesus is talking about, he's, he's sharing a story here to help these people understand what it looks like to hear from God. He says this, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and they do what? They come to him. The gatekeeper opens the gate and the sheep recognize his voice. So sheep, Jesus is talking about here, sheep have the ability to recognize a shepherd's voice. In fact, you can get multiple herds of sheep together, mix them all up. I'm talking about hundreds. And one shepherd could do his little call like whoop. Whoop, whoop, or whatever the call is, and those sheep, even though they're all intermingled, would move out and actually be in tune to the voice of that particular shepherd. You can have multiple ones together. And so, why? Because the, the sheep are trained to immediately follow the voice of the shepherd. So the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice, and they come to him. Now watch this. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. He calls them by name. Verse 4 says, after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. He walks, I can't, I can't stress this enough, that we have to allow God to, leave our, to lead our life. Amen, everybody. We have to allow God to, 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 it's important to allow God to lead our way and our choices and our directions and our decisions, praying first. And it says, after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They won't follow competing voices. No, they'll run from that. They'll run from him. Why? Because they don't know his voice. The sheep know his voice. And I want you, I want you to be able to distinguish God's voice in your own life. I want you to distinguish this. And I honestly, when we, st when we start talking about this series, for a lot of people, this is absolutely critical. Like maybe you're in a season right now where you like absolutely need to hear from God. Like you just need it. Like it's, this is a season right now. You're like, God, I need you. I need to hear from you. I got some big decisions. I got some things coming up in my life. I, I, need, I need to hear you. And we need to learn how to filter out the noise so that we can hear clearly. Amen, everybody. In Luke chapter 8, we're going to talk about this parable that Jesus, um, that Jesus gives his disciples. And at the end of this parable, the one of the ends of this verse, he says this, he who has ears to hear, let him, let him hear. So he's saying, hey, if, if you've got ears to hear about this, then I want you to hear about this. And this is my prayer for you for this message and for this series. It's found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. This is my heart. This is my hope for you. It says, listen for God's voice in everything you do. Listen for God's voice when, when, when you wake up, before that appointment, before that, before, that, uh, before that big day, before that big decision, before you, you step into an, uh, 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 just a new arena of life. Before you, before you do that, Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go, and he's the one who's going to keep you on track. Like, he's the only one who's able to keep you on track. He's the only one that's going to be able to, why? Because when you let the one who designed you define you and define your life, he knows the best path that you need to take. Amen, somebody? He really does. So what if you could hear him and it just cut through the noise? What if we cut out this noise? I think that you and I would realize that he actually speaks a lot more than we realize. And so when Jesus is talking about he who has ears to hear, let him hear, there's actually a story that precedes that. 
And I want to talk to you and bring this to you today. Look in your message note sheet, uh, Luke chapter 8 and verse 5. And Jesus is talking, uh, he's telling a parable to his disciples to help them understand some things. He said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he scattered the seed, some fell among the path. And it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. So, in other words, somebody stole it. So it was stolen. It was sown, but it was stolen. And then it says, some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because it had no moisture. In other words, there was rocks that were competing with the soil, and therefore it, it, it didn't get any moisture. The other seed fell among thorns which grew up, and it choked out the plants. So, so the thorns here is, is weeds. So there's weeds that grew up, and it choked, it's choked these plants out. It smothered the plant. Then it says, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up. It yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. And then Jesus said this again. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear. And so then what Jesus does is he actually goes in and he talks to them about what this parable actually means. He didn't do this all the time, but in this particular instance, he tells them what they are. And I want to tell you today that you are one of these four. You are one of these four scenarios, and I want to break it down to you. I want to break it down to you. In, in verse 11 in Luke chapter 8, this, Jesus tells them the meaning of this parable, and he said this. The meaning of this parable is this. It's so important. That the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. And some people are like, well, yeah, the word of God, that's the Bible. Well, they didn't have the Bible back then. Like, the word of God is the Bible, okay? But it's also the voice of God. It's, it's the voice of God. So he said, this is the meaning. The seed is this. This is the seed. And so if we understand what the seed is, and we understand what the soil is, then we'll know where our part is as well. Amen, somebody? You guys still here? So if this is the case, if the seed is the word of God, there's nothing wrong with the seed. For God is perfect. For God is the same at all times, at all places, and for all people. He is the constant. We are not. He's the constant. And so if, if, that's, if the word of God is the seed, there's nothing wrong with the seed. Then it's not a God-speaking issue. We start in Luke 8, verse 12, and Jesus talks about the four different types of conditions of our heart. He talks about these four things, these four ways that the seed is sown, and it helps us identify where we are at in our life. Verse 12, it says this, those along the path are the ones who hear, and then look at this, the devil comes. You know when it said the birds ate it? When they sowed the seeds and the birds ate it? Well, the birds, that was the symbolism from the devil. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes, and they take away the word from their so the place that it was sown, that the seed was sown, was where? It was in our heart. So the, the devil comes and takes it away so that they may not believe and be saved. Think about that for a moment. So the condition of the soil, write this down somewhere in your notes. The condition of the soil is the condition of your heart. The condition of the soil is the, diff is the condition of your heart. And Jesus is talking about four types of soil. He's talking about four experiences, four types of soil that really one of them are you and one of them are me. One of them we kind of struggle with and, and we're trying to get to, to, to one of them. And so he's saying, listen, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because this, this soil, you're, you're actually this. There's nothing wrong with the seed. God wants to sow his seed into your life, but it's the condition of the soil that determines how fruitful this seed is. Number one is this, write this down. It's called the polluted heart. The polluted heart. These are the soil conditions, heart conditions. And so what, what this is, is God's trying to speak, but you got some junk in your hearts. You got some stuff in your heart. Now look at me real quick. I, I, I'm not here to condemn you, right? 
I'm not here to tell you, y'all, you're just a bunch of sinners. You know, you just need, you just need to repent. You just need to, you know, I'm not here to tell you that. What I'm, I'm trying to give you some hope, right? Because here's the deal. We all need some hope, amen, somebody. But, here, but if, we don't, if we don't look at Scripture and identify and see some of these things, we won't know how to make a change in our life. So God's trying to speak, but you got some stuff going on. He just wants to wake you up to that fact. That, hey, there, there's some stuff going on in your life, and, he, it, and really, he'll fix it if you allow him to. Like, he wants to fix it if, if you'll let him. And to be honest with you, look at me real quick, this can happen to us all. This pollution takes over our heart, and we can't hear clearly. We can't, we can't hear what God wants to say to us. And pollution, it really happens one of two ways. Number one, it happens what we did to ourselves. Like, we did it. Like, it's the sin that we commit, the mistakes that we do, the things that happen in our life. Like, like we did it to ourselves. And the next one, the next reason why pollution happens is people. Gosh darn people. Mess with us. Right? And we kind of think, well, yeah, those people that happened to us. No, really, it's, it's not the people of what they did. It's really in your heart, your response to somebody else. It's the unforgiveness that you hold. It's the things that you're holding against people, and it's keeping you from hearing what God wants to say to you in your life. It's keeping you from hearing clearly because you're allowing this offense, this pain to build up a wall in your life, and so you can't hear clearly because you haven't really dealt with that. God wants to talk to you. He wants to speak to you, but... You can't hear because there's so much noise in your heart. And, and really, to be honest with you, the devil tries to stir up this stuff, usually in the relationships that are closest to us, usually in our, with our spouse or with our kids, right? The people that are closest to us, that's what it just stirs it all up. And sometimes we think the problem between you and the person is that problem. It's not. It's the enemy trying to stop you from hearing from God. Like there is an enemy that is at raid against us. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Like he's a real enemy. This is not a, some figurative person. He doesn't like you. You're already in the kingdom. He can't stand you because you already belong to God. You have what he wanted. He can't stand you, so he's going to try to bring offense and bring pain and bring wedges between your relationships. And sometimes it's not the problem. Sometimes we look at the issue. No, we have to identify it's the enemy sometimes trying to build a wedge so you don't advance in the kingdom of God so that you can't hear God clearly and move forward in your life. We got to understand this. Like, have you not been there when you, when you wonder why people are like, how could they say that to me? How could they do that to me? How could they respond like that? I even had a situation, you know, that happened um, recently where somebody accused me of doing something that I didn't do or whatever, and, and it was kind of like, how could, like, how could that, how could they even think that of me, right? How could, I know it's never happened to y'all, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> like, how could they think that? And, like, when, you, when you're criticized for something that's not true, Man, it's like it double hurts. You know what I'm talking about? Because, like, at least if I deserved it, okay? Like, it gives me flashback to when I was a kid, and I had a little baby sister. And she used to, uh, she was the baby, and she used to get me in trouble and say I did something when I didn't. You know, she would say, he hit me, or he did this, or whatever, and then I'd get spanked. And there's nothing, there's something about getting disciplined for something that you didn't do that just, so you know what I would do? You know, when I was little? I would actually go hit her. I'm like, listen, I'd rather get disciplined twice for something I did do than discipline once for something I didn't do. Amen, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? So, hey, maybe I'm the only one, right? So I'm like, listen, you're going to get yours. You know, God's redeemed me from that. Okay, thank you, Jesus. But my point is, when somebody accuses you of something you didn't do, it's like painful. It's painful, and all the time you're thinking about it, and it happens whenever you go to God in prayer, and you're trying to approach him, and all of a sudden this issue rises. And you're like, man, like, and, and, and you're like, oh, you, you don't think it's, it's just, just like, ah, it's just something small, and then 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes go by. you got something in your heart that you need to deal with. Are you listening to me today? 
You got to release that. Release that person. Some, some, maybe you need to go to that person. Some of us aren't having conversations with God because either we've allowed sin in our life and we haven't given it to God yet or we have this wound we haven't dealt with. It's true. We have this wound we, and we've, we have a polluted heart and we got to deal with it. We got to clear up our heart. In fact, in James chapter 1, verse 21, it says this. It says, Humble, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. Get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the message, the voice, the word. Humbly accept the message that God has planted in your hearts. Watch this, for it is strong enough to save your soul. Like his word is enough. His word is strong enough. His voice, his, what he wants to do through your life is strong enough to bring hope and healing to you. But here's the deal. We got to get rid of some stuff. Like we got to get rid of it. If we don't get rid of it, it's going to be difficult to accept the message. A lot of us want to accept the message. Even we sit here on a Sunday or we, or we listen to a podcast or we, we want to accept the message, but we haven't really got rid of some stuff. I'm telling you, there's no way that you can step into your purpose until you let go of your pain. I said, there's no way you can step into your purpose until you let go of your pain. We got to move past it. We got to move past it. Amen, somebody. I'm telling you, write this down. You can't begin a new life until we turn from the old. Like, we can't do it. We can't, we can't begin a new life until we turn from the old. We got to turn from the old. I know some of this is kind of deep. Some of this is kind of moving. But if you find yourself and God is working on your heart, just ask him, God, what do you want me to do? And ask him, God, do I, what do I need to give to you? Here's the next soil condition, moving along. And verse 13, it says this, The rocky soil represents those who hear the message with joy, but like young plants in such soil, the roots don't go very deep. Like they don't have deep roots. They believe for a while, but they wilt. Like something else competed with this. There was a competing voice, and the roots didn't go very deep because there was competition for the moisture, for the water of the world. There was competition, and therefore it didn't go very deep. It looked healthy in the beginning, but all of a sudden, because of the competing voices, it wilted. It wilts. I mean, I, and this happens to me a lot. Like, I'll hear a message, right? Because I, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and messages. I listen to a message on, man, that's the best message I ever heard. Wow, that's amazing. I know y'all, you know, you think that every Sunday. So you, know, you don't have to laugh that hard. Here's the deal. Uh, I hear a message and then I go out and all of a sudden there's a competing voice. I get distracted and I have the greatest of intentions to do that, which I have heard, but I really don't end up doing that. Has that ever happened to you? Just look straight and nod your head this way because don't elbow the person next to you. But it's true, right? As soon as you go out to live that life, something competed, it, competed with it, and it's like you never heard it. And then you get frustrated at yourself. You live in frustration because you're like, man, I had every intention of doing this. What do we call this? This is called the distracted heart. The distracted heart. You just distract it. You had every intention of doing it, but something else has caught your attention. It's kind of like trying to talk to your spouse when you got a bunch of kids in the car making noise. When you're trying to talk, you're like, hey, let's have a conversation. And you got five kids, like, where are we going? Are we there yet? Are we going to be here? Can we stop here? I got to go to the bathroom. Like, you just went five minutes ago. You know, and, and then you got all of these things that they're on a game, like they got their headphones on, and you think they're going to be quiet when they have their headphones on with the game, right, in the car. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. And they talk constantly. It's like headphones are supposed to you to be quiet. It's not for you to talk, right? You, st you talk, you're louder with headphones on. Any parents in here, you know what I'm talking about? I'm like, it doesn't matter if you got headphones or not. You still just as loud. I can't have a conversation. You, you want to have a conversation. You're like, what? What did you say? Yeah, okay. You know, and then you're like, turn down. Would you be quiet? You know. You see what I'm saying? 
it's, it's just so many distractions. You never really get to what you want to talk about. And you just say, oh, we're just, we're just going to talk later. We're just, we'll, just, we'll talk about this later. And do you? No. You have the best of intention, but oftentimes you don't because it's so distracted, competing, competing voices. Let me just, let me just tell you that the biggest distraction for me in my life is this thing. It's my smartphone. I mean, I had to actually get into a habit because I used to wake up and grab my smartphone. And I would I have a prayer in Bible time every single morning, and uh, specifically. And so what, what would happen is I would go to grab my phone to, to read my Bible or do a prayer plan, and I'd get these little thing pops up called notifications. And then you're like, I'm just going to take a quick peek. Just, 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 just real quick peek. I said, somebody said something on Instagram, you know, about me or the church. I'm just going to, just, just real quick. Somebody said something about Facebook and tag me. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to just, 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 just a little bit, just a little bit. And all of a sudden, 30 minutes later, you're like, oh my gosh, I got to like, you know, I got to get to the gym or I got to jump in the shower. I got to take the kids to school. And I just lost all the time that I intentionally, anybody been there? You get so distracted. So I had to like, I had to move where I, number one, I I don't get any notifications from basically uh, 10 p.m. till seven in the morning. No notifications. And then the first, I don't even grab my phone. The first thing that I do, because if I grab my phone, I don't trust me. Like, y'all are probably way more disciplined than me. That's fine. If I grab it, I'm going to be distracted. It's just the way that it is. So I have to go to my prayer time. No phone. And then whenever I get to my Bible, I, I, I get it. No notifications. Open up the Bible app, and I start right there. And it's there. And it's been consistent. Like, it's been great. Um, but I'm telling you, before, I would try to do that, and I would have great intentions and try to have great willpower, but it would fail. It would fail. I know y'all don't know anything about what I'm talking about today. So, so this, this distracted heart, man, it, this is the soil condition that speaks the most to me because it's the easiest one for me to do. And I want to, see you, I want to show you a story real quick of two sisters who, who had this kind of same opportunity to hear from Jesus, but they, show, uh, they chose differently. Uh, and Luke chapter 10 says this, and she, talking about Martha uh, Magdalene, says she had a sister named Mary, and who seated herself at the Lord's feet, watch this, and was listening to his teaching. So Mary was listening to his teaching, but Martha was overly occupied and too busy. She was what? She was distracted. She was distracted with much serving. And I've done this. I've, done, I've, been, I've gotten so distracted with serving God that I stopped spending time with God. And, 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 and he's drawing me closer. And, and the thing is, is God wants to move his purpose through you. So serving is great, but he, more than God wanting your gifts, look at me, everybody, he wants you. He just really wants you. He wants, he wants all of you. He wants all of you. He wants every part of you. More than the giftings that he gave to you to move through you, he wants all of you. And so, well, what do I got to do? Well, to hear God's voice, I got to turn down the world's volume. If I'm going to hear God's voice correctly, I got to turn down the world's volume. I got to turn it down. If, if, if I'm going to hear it, the outside noise, I just got to turn it down. So let's have ears to hear. We need to have ears to hear. Amen, somebody? Amen. Here's the third. Watch this. We've got to move kind of fast here. Luke chapter 18, verse 14 says this. This is the seed that fell among the weeds. It fell among the weeds. Here, you ever tried to grow a weed? You don't have to grow no weeds. It just shows up. You know what I'm talking about? It, it's not invited to the party. But they show up anyways, right? It's kind of funny, right? You'll have grass that's completely dead, and then you'll have a weed that's green going straight up. You know, how in the world did all of this die, but this weed is green as can be? It makes absolutely no sense. They just show up whenever they want to, right? 
But if you walked by somebody's house and it was full of weeds, what would you think? What word would come to mind? I'll tell you. Neglect. Neglect would be the word. And they neglected to take care of it. These are seeds that fell among the weeds. They stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked. They're choked out by life's worries, by riches and pleasures, other things, and they don't do what? They don't mature. Like they start off great, but they got something growing up next to it that's choking it out. These, these worries of life, these, this fear of life, this pursuit of wealth, the pleasures of this life, the entertainment of this life, and they don't really mature because they're giving themselves too much over to these other competing voices. They don't mature. What is this? What is this soil condition? Write this down in your notes. This is the immature heart. This is the immature heart. This is the heart that says, you know what? Me and Jesus, we're good. I'm fine with where I'm at. I'm fine with where I'm at. But God, I'm telling you, God is saying, let's go a little bit deeper. God is, God is telling you, I want to go deeper with you. I want to take you to a place where you've never been before. I want to move you with my word, my spirit, my presence in your life. I want to move in your life to a dimension that you've never seen before, that you will be close to me and you will do amazing and have amazing results in your life. This is what he wants from you. But we got we to gotta grow up a little bit. We got to mature a little bit in order to hear. You know, when my son Jackson was one years old, he was like really, really talkative kid. He's still talkative now. But I mean, I mean, he's just, just so talkative. And I used to come in him, hey, hey, Jackson is a, hey, you call him Jack Jack, right? Because it's right during the Incredibles. Jack Jack, Jackson, Jackson, what's up? Hey, you want, you want Baba? <gasps> Baba? You want to give me Baba? So he would run all the way around. And, you know, I used to, you know, you used to saw the little baby talk that, you know, you talk to him. He said, you want Baba? You want Baba? Yeah, and his eyes would light up. I want Baba, okay. So he used to, and then, you know, the Baba was obviously the bottle. But I would talk to him on the level only that he understood. Now he's 11. We have amazing conversations, and we talk about real life. And uh, we have some of the same interests, uh, interests in basketball and all that stuff. And I talk to him differently than I did then. Why? Because he's mature. And I'm telling you that some of you are dissatisfied at the level of communication God has with you right now. But that's because you haven't really grown up. Don't throw nothing at me now. <laughs> but it's true. Maybe it's on us to grow up a little bit. What if we looked at our spiritual life and said, yeah, I need to go a little bit deeper. Maybe I need to go a little, maybe I should be obedient in that area that I haven't been obedient in. Maybe I should actually take a step there. That's what mature people do. They make the necessary adjustments. So it takes discipline to do those things. It takes discipline uh, to live a life that pleases God, to do some of these things. It really does. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 says this. It says, since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, this means people that are around you, people that are full of uh, full of the wisdom of God. Since we are surrounded by this, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially the sin that distracts us. We must run the race that lies ahead of us and never give up. We must focus on Jesus. Like, we got to have our focus accurately. We've got to have our focus correctly. And I want to take you through this scripture real quick to give you some understanding again. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says this. I'm going to highlight these words. It says, since we, 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 us, us, we, us. What does this mean? It means you're not supposed to do it by yourself. You're not supposed to do this alone. In other words, this maturity process, it doesn't happen just you and God. It happens through relationships with other people. It happens when iron sharpens iron. It happens through relationships. Since we are surrounded, we must do this. It slows us down. It, it distracts us. Uh, we're to get, so this whole context of this scripture is, is defined in the parameters of us as a church being together. 
Like we're designed to live life together. Don't be isolated by yourself. Like you should have a personal relationship with God. You should have a private relationship, but you also should have a public or shared relationship with God through the expression of other people. It's not just one individually. It's actually, that's why small groups are so important. Maturity comes and we stop making excuses and we start making changes. That's when maturity comes. We, 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 we gotta, we can't, I tell our leadership team all the time, we can make progress or we can make excuses, but we can't make both. So we gotta choose. We gotta choose. We can't, if we want to mature, if we really wanna be what God's called us to be, we, we've got to stop making excuses. We've got to start making changes. And I'm telling you, there's some steps here at our church. We make it very simple. We tell you to belong, to join the church, and to go through the growth track. Jump into a small group. Jump on our team. Jump on the dream team. Start serving in our community. Like, let's start living out this faith that we have, and, and maturity will happen. You'll be able to hear from God, and you will live the most blessed peace-filled, and fulfilled life ever. I, prom I promise you, I promise this to you. And I, I, I know this from experience, and I know this from what I've seen. And it won't, it won't even take that long. In fact, that's the radius challenge. The radius challenge is give us a year of your life. Jump on the growth track. Get in the small group. Jump on the dream team. And if in a year's time, your life isn't fulfilled, and you're not in a way better place, I'll help you find another church because I didn't do my job. But I'm telling you, it, it, it won't take that long. It won't. Because there's people here, sitting here in this room that could tell you, you know, they'll say, man, like, my life, I got to a small group, I went to the grocery, like, my life has changed. It's changed. Man, I'm so much better than where I was before. And I say, I oh, know. Why? Not because this church is so amazing. It's because that God's word works. Amen, somebody? Amen. His word works. It just works if you work it. It works. And so here's the last one. If you make those, uh, take those steps and make those changes, then you become like this next soil that Jesus talks about, and it's the good soil. It's the good soil. It says, but the seed on good soil that was sown into good soil stands for those with a noble and a good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a good crop. And write this down in your notes. This is just the prepared heart. This is the prepared heart. So either we can have a, a heart that is polluted. Either we can have a heart that's distracted. We can have a heart that's immature. Or we can have a heart that's prepared. And the choice really is you. You might be saying, Aaron, how do I prepare my heart? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. Write this down. Number one, we got to repent. Now, this word, sometimes people think, oh, you know, it sounds like a, a dirty church word. You know, y'all just need to repent. Turn from your way. You know, no, it's not like that. It's not like that. You know what repent means? It means to turn. It means you were going this way, and we're going to stop, and we're going to turn, and we're going to go this way. That's all it means. Just turn. Just turn. God will forgive you right now where you're at. He will forgive you. Just make a decision. Look at me. Some of you think that you, here and here, think that you've disappointed God. He, God is bigger than your flaw. That's right. He's bigger than your insecurity. He's bigger than your pain. He loves you so much. He's not disappointed in you either. He doesn't. He's not, he's not disappointed. In fact, you can't disappoint him. Because his love for you is not on the basis of what you have done. His love is on the basis of who he is. Because even when you're not, he still is. So that means that I can't do anything to impress him. But it also means I can't do anything to disappoint him. So I live within these lines of God. I'm just going to accept the love that you've given towards me. And I'm not going to try to live my life trying to win your approval because you love me regardless. Think about that. That frees you, but that doesn't make you, that doesn't make you want to draw back. That makes you want to run towards God. Amen, everybody? 
I'm telling you, that's the greatness and the goodness of our God. That's why the gospel news is such good news. We just need to repent and, and, and come to him because he is the God of multiple chances. Again and again and again. So we've got to repent. Number two, write this down. We've got to refocus. We've got to refocus. What does it mean? It means go to bed an hour earlier. Some of y'all laughed at me a little bit. Maybe you need to cut the Netflix back. Cut back to Hulu. Cut back to YouTube. Cut back to Facebook or Instagram. Cut it in half. You can make progress or you can make excuses, but you can't make both. People don't change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. When you say, I can't stay here, that's when you change. In fact, don't worry about what you haven't done. Just start where you are now. I said, don't worry about what you haven't done. Don't worry about what you haven't done. Start where you are now. I got some people who are like, Aaron, I'm, I'm back in April on the Bible plan. I got months. Stop. Get out of April. Just, just stop it, right? You're trying to cram in hours of the day so you can catch up. You're not enjoying it, and God's not enjoying it either, okay? Let's just, let's just get back. Let's refocus. Let's refocus. Don't worry about what you haven't done. Just start where you are right now. Refocus. Number three. Write this down, revive. Ask God to bring revival to your life. Ask him to bring it to your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says this. Let's make a clean break. Let's just do it. Let's just make a clean break with everything that defiles or distracts us, both from within and without. Watch this. Let us make our entire lives fit in holy temples for the worship of God. Let's just do it. Let's just make a decision to make a clean break with these things. Like, let's go all in. It's critical that we go all in. And I'll end, I'll conclude with the story. Because it was the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016, so it's not that long ago, that I was in the most broken season of my life. Broken. For the first time ever, I didn't, and I've lived a good life in a Christian home. I really didn't even know what brokenness was until you really go through it. You see, at the end of that, 2015, I lost my mom to a battle of cancer, and it was tough. I resigned a position at a church of being the executive pastor which was hard, the church I've, I've been at for 20 years, the only church I've ever known. I was on my way to go to another church, and in six weeks I got a letter. It really wasn't a letter. It was them telling me that, now we're going a different way. So I lost my ministry. I was on my way to pastor another church and they just cut me out. So I'm grieving. I feel rejected. Questioning my calling, questioning God, how, how could you let this happen? Like I'm serving you. I don't get it. Why am I going? I just felt so broken and so alone. The only thing that I had was my relationship with him. Say, God, I don't know, but I trust you. He was in that season. I was broken for the first time, really. The only thing that I knew was to seek God. And let me tell you something real quick. When you're desperate, you go all in. Because you don't got nothing left to lose. Like, I don't, I don't have anything, God. I, I don't feel, I just lost. You ever been there? Some of you might be there right now. And so I pressed in. I pressed in and I prayed and I spent a season of just asking God. I repented, I refocused. I asked God to revive my soul. 
And you know what he gave me? He gave me you. He gave me this church. He put this in my heart. And that's why I love, I love our church. That's why I love you so much. Because it came from a season of brokenness that God put a vision inside of me to reach a people with his love. To bring hope and healing to a generation that hasn't yet experienced it. To be a church where people can come and take the mask off. Not fake it till you make it, but actually come, be real, and actually find true healing. And when I was willing to go all in, I noticed that God went all in with me and his voice was clear. Why? Because I prepared for it. And that's the last point in your notes, that God's voice is clearest in a prepared environment. His voice is the clearest in a prepared environment environment. And God's trying to speak to you. I know he wants to speak to you. We just have to prepare. We got to prepare our lives. It doesn't matter what, where we're at in our, in the soil of our lives. We just need to make a decision today to go all in with Jesus. And I promise you, you will start to hear clearly. Amen, everybody. Amen. Let's pray today. Can I ask you a question? Where are you at today in your life right now? Could it be that you need to go all in with Jesus? If you do, all it is is praying a simple prayer. And it's so simple because you can't earn it. You can't Forgiveness is not something that can be earned. It's something that can only be received. So if that's you today, and maybe you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, and God's tugging on your heart today, or maybe you've once followed Christ, but maybe you fell off and you're saying, Aaron, I need to come back to God today. I need to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life again. I need to turn from the way that I was going. I need to repent. I need to go the way that God has for me. I need to let go of my pain. And I need to step towards my purpose today. If that's you, God wants to meet you right now where you are at. I want to lead you in a simple prayer of reconciliation and forgiveness back to God. Are you ready? Just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I believe that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die for me. I receive him now as my Lord and as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I receive your forgiveness of my sins. I confess you as my Lord. I give you the controls of my life right now. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I want to say welcome to the family of God or welcome back to the family of God. So I would just tell you, if you could text the word next to the number on the screen, because we want to give you some next steps how to walk this thing out. It's so important that we learn how to walk out our faith and we actually get some connection with other people uh, so we can live this out the way that God has for us. So if you do me a favor, you can comment or you can text the word next to the number on the screen. We're so excited that you made a decision for Christ. And if this message really meant something to you today, hey, help us by sharing this message. When you share the link, you share the love. And right before we go, I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. Father God, I pray for every person that's watching this message. I ask you, God, to bless them. I ask you to keep them. Father God, that your face would shine upon them. You would lift up your countenance upon them, God, and bring them peace. Help them, God, to make a difference in this world, to be who you have called them to be, and allow your love to shine through them to other people. I thank you for this today. In Jesus' name, amen.